he just started to laugh. He goes, I've, I've never in all my years, I've never seen one, I've never heard of one. And I said, well, the regulations don't specify that it has to be vertical. Why couldn't it be horizontal? And he said, well, probably because they just presume that they're going to, I said, yeah, but it doesn't say, you know, it doesn't say that. And so he, uh, he finally said, I'll tell you what, he says, I'm, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to deny that application. But you're entitled to appeal to the, to the state building department. And if they grant it, we'll go along with it. You know, and I said, well, all right. I said, there's one, one more thing. He goes, what's that? I said, I want you to agree not to oppose our application. Just stay out of it. And so he said, that's fine. And uh, so we, we had to go down to Columbus and had a hearing and the state Board of Building Appeals, or whatever it was called in those days, they, I can still remember the looks on those guys' faces. You know, you're talking about a horizontal fire loss. That's what it is. And they approved it. And so that's been kind of a, kind of an inside joke around here for the last 20 years or, or so, that we have the only approved horizontal firewall in the history of the state of Ohio from the building commission. But as a result of that uh, issue, actually the, the uh, building commissioner and, and I uh, and some of the other guys on our committee, um, I mean, we, we, that kind of brought us together. Um, and, you know, we were able to, you know, work together to work out some of the other issues. Um, the, uh, our, our stairway uh, on the south side, the main stairway from the lobby up to the second floor, uh, technically would have had to be uh, fireproofed, which means we'd have to put a wall um, uh, up there. And the building commissioner says, look, as far as I'm concerned, that whole thing is an outside lobby. You know, and that, that helped us a lot, you know, because that would have looked horrible. Uh, and, you know, and I, I, I would tell them, I said, that's going to be less safe than it is now. If you've got that all boxed in and people can't see where the stairway is, and then you're going to have to go through a door, and then, you know, um, so he's all, okay, okay. He goes, that, that's, a, that's an outside lobby. And I said, well, that's how it was designed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so they, they, the, the city worked with us, uh, you know, very well to, to solve the, you know, solve those issues at that time. But that was, uh, that was quite a project. I, I think we spent a lot of time. We had a meeting, I think, of our, of our subcommittee on the building, like every Monday morning for like two, two and a half hours for throughout the construction project. So what was the scope of that addition? It was the <coughs> boardroom, the main dining room, the bar up here? The bar, um, the whole uh, extension of the grill room downstairs, and I believe we also expanded the, uh, the men's grill uh, yes. at that time, and maybe even the locker room south a little yeah. bit. We expanded that, uh, the men's grill almost a hundred percent. Yeah. And then uh, part of that for the locker room and maintenance was added on. Right. And they would put a stairwell in the back. Exactly. Uh, on the Dolphin dining room. Right. As a fire escape type of thing. Right. Yes. And is that when the halfway house was built over where the Tillinghast room is now? No. No. no that was later. No. They put okay. the uh, cart bar in. Uh, that yeah. was uh, moved over from where it was then back over to where the new car barn was. So where was a member's dining room before the addition? <laughs> um, well, we had the, the old upstairs, okay. uh, but uh, 
Well, one of the issues, you know, uh, you know as society changes, you know, and, and use, uses of buildings change, uh, one of the problems was uh, we would have a lot of functions and weddings up here, um, and then that would take up the space. And there was no uh, formal type dining area available for the members. And so the idea was, let's create a space that's going to be nice and formal where the members can always count on going to have dinner, you know, with their guests and, and friends, even if there's a wedding going on or something like that. And so that was part of the consideration um, there because of the conflicts with outside, outside uh, parties and functions. And, uh, you know, it seems like today people don't want formal dining uh, uh, anymore. So, you know, we just have to uh, adapt with the changes in society. And then I, I, I think also, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, p people were using, uh, using the facilities more. Um, and there was more demand for other, other types of functions, you know, uh, company meetings and things like that. So we wanted to create a space, uh, you know, for the members that they could more or less count on uh, to be able to use. Um, so obviously, what, was that renovation or addition before your presidency, or that was during it? During, during it. Okay, mm -hmm. so that was the landmark of your two years, no doubt. Yep, I would say. I would say. Um, yeah, to reiterate, Dave, David really came in uh, as a individual who had the legal background as well as the information and, and structure to go ahead and take a situation which could be very, very costly mm -hmm. and literally shut down the building and just not do anything to a status of completion, plus running the club and having the social events and so on and, and taking care of all of that. So it, it was a 150% type of operation. You just could not do 100%. He took care of them and guided that whole thing through there and a, and, a, and a great tribute is due date for that time frame which he was president for those two years in 85 and 86 so well we had a good board uh, yes. you know Vic you were part of the board right. and and you know we had some uh, good knowledgeable members on our committee and exactly. and you know they all uh, pitched in so it was a you know a team a team effort but it was a interesting and exciting time for our club in those. That was a major in those step. Days, yeah. Major, major expansion. Yeah. yeah. I guess I didn't realize when this building was built back in the '60s that it mm -hmm. was as small as it was back then. Oh, you know, it was probably twenty-five thousand square feet, and you know, it was, you know, it, since that time there's been probably three additional major uh, renovations, expansions on it, and uh, so on. You know, you uh, you know, talk about uh, the the club and you know the various uh, personalities over the years. Uh, you know, one one who has served as the club president or a member of the board or the green committee or something. You know, could not help but you know recall stories from Chuck Lott, who was our uh, golf course superintendent over the years. Um, you know, pe the the I think one of his trademarks was his handiwork with the flowers out here uh, over the years, and it was kind of interesting because um, you talk to people and you'd ask them if they're familiar with Lakewood Country Club, and they go, "Yeah, I played there one time. Boy, they had beautiful flowers." <laughs> you know, the greens wouldn't roll; <laughs> <That's right. Yes. laughs> they were pretty slow and. You know, there was water all over the place because it got, 
just sprinkled the heck out of everything. But you know, no, those had beautiful flowers. But uh, you know, Chuck was, uh, you know, he, he was a caretaker. He he wasn't, he wasn't a greenskeeper. He was a caretaker. I mean, that guy. Uh, uh, th this this country club keeping this thing going was his life. It was his life, you know, and he was virtually here, you know, day and night. I mean, no matter what was, you know, what kind of an issue was going on, he was here to to handle it. I, I can recall, um, and, you know, and and budget constraints obviously were were a part of things, and he had to allocate his money on on things that were important, and and sand bunkers were not important to to Chuck Lott. And uh, uh, I recall during my my tenure, we were getting a lot of complaints about the bunkers because they were primarily hard clay uh, with very little sand in them, and and if there'd be a rain, it would wash the sand almost off of the higher spots, and it would all be concentrated in the lower spots in the in the bunkers. And you know, Chuck didn't want to spend too much maintenance pushing it back up. So one time when I was playing, I he was doing some maintenance around the seventh seventh green, and I took him over to the to the bunker on the left side, and I said, Chuck, you know, look at this. This is nothing but hard clay. I said, you can't hit a, a consistent shot out of here. Nobody can, you know, can play that shot off of this this clay like this. And he just looked at it for a while, and it got the twinkle in his eye and the little smirk on his on his face, and says, well, I'd try not to go in there then. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so I, I go, okay, okay, that's the solution. I'll try not to hit it in there anymore. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Certain amount of wisdom there. Yeah. Yeah. How about individual members, uh, the club and instances of uh, parties or golf tournaments or fun things that you recall or that were outstanding in memory? Well, uh, when you think of members, um, I mean, how how could you conceive of the Lakewood Country Club being without John Packle? Um, I mean, he's a personality that's larger than life out here. Whether you whether you love him or or just put up with him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's there's no denying that he's uh, he's been uh, I mean, you know uh, again he this this place has almost been his life also I mean he's he knows everybody and everybody knows him and he's always <coughs> very friendly when when he was uh, still playing um, I used to play a lot of golf with with John. Uh, play with John and uh, Don Rebar and um, uh, Chuck Periano Sr. We we used to play almost uh, almost every weekend uh, for uh, for a number of years. I remember Don uh, Don Rebar uh, one time. He wasn't playing very well. And we uh, were teeing off on 14, and he hits this great drive. I mean, it was super. He's right down the middle, just past the bunker on the left, and just in the middle of the fairway. And we're going, going to approach the balls, and he's like, "Maybe, maybe I can finally get this round going. You know, I finally hit one." Well, he takes his fairway wood and just dead top the next shot. You know, and, and he's just shakes his head and he goes, I wish I could quit golf. <laughs> and I go, what? He goes, oh, I hate it. I just wish I could quit it. You know, and, and he says, I hate work. 
you know, and he says, you can only have so much sex because you can't drink all the time. I don't have anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to keep playing. I go, well, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> but I, you know, it's that kind of, uh, that kind of an attitude um, where you can come up with that kind of a line after you've just, you know, deflated yourself. Um, you know, well, that, that speaks to what kind of a guy Don Rebar is. That's probably why he's been successful in life. I mean, you see, you can see those kinds of traits in people uh, on, on what happens on the golf course. I've often said that that's, uh, you know, the game of golf is a big uh, mirror of how you approach life. Uh, and it is a real reflection. And I, you know, that to have that kind of an attitude when you're, you know, some guys would would pout and you know complain and moan and you know Don is just hey that's just one of those things it's not having a good day so you know make the make the best of it you know one of the things that golfers need to understand is that if they're not playing well they can have a bad round but don't make it a bad round for the other three guys you know and so um, that. Uh, that's something I've always uh, admired in people. I mentioned uh, uh, John Packel. I, 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 <coughs> I can remember uh, um, this was uh, John and I, I think Chuck Periano Sr. and I don't know if Don was, was playing with us then or not, but we were teeing off on uh, 13. And um, this was before we extended the tees and everything on 13 and the, the woods area and brush area between new 12 and the 13th tee was much more grown up. It was, it was larger um, in those days. And, and we were waiting for the uh, group ahead of us to clear. And uh, Johnny decided that uh, he had to take care of some business. <laughs> and rather than go to the uh, restrooms that were just right to there. the left, right there, uh, he decided to just go in the bushes there between the new 12 and, and 13. So he came back. And he's got the most sheepish look on his face that you can imagine. And the left side of his khaki golf slacks are just wet all the way down the whole left side. And I mean, no, there's no way he could hide it. You know, and I'm like, Johnny, what happened to you? And he's, you know, he's, you could, you could tell he just, you know, doesn't want to say. I said, well, what, you know, what happened? You run into a sprinkler? You know, and he goes, well, I was just getting started and I saw a golf ball. <laughs> and I had to pick it up. <laughs> you know, and I said, what? Somebody's got to get there before you can. <laughs> I said, is that what was going through your head? I better pick up this thing right away because somebody might come here and sneak it away before I'm done. <laughs> but that was, uh, that, that was an incident, and I tease him about that, uh, you know, even now. And he, 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 you know, he, 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 he takes it all in stride. He's a, he's a good guy. He takes that. I, Talk about uh, you know members and things. Um, again, I don't know how long ago this was, but uh, you know it was uh, Johnny, me, and Chuck Periano, and a new member, relatively new member at that time. His name was Bob Melanick. Oh yes. Bob Melanick. And uh, Bob was a very outgoing, very social guy. Uh, big guy and he could really hit a ball and when he'd get his timing right <clears throat> but he had a tendency to pull a lot of shots 
shorter irons and whatnot. And so uh, I think it's Johnny and I are partners and it's Bob Melanick and Chuck Priano Sr. And, um, uh, Johnny would have a tendency all the time of asking where the shot was. He's like, are you on the green? Where is it? Are you on the green? Because he couldn't see. You know, and uh, so we're like, number one, Bob gets a good drive and then hits it in the bunker and Johnny's, is it on? Is it on? He goes, no, it's not on. He goes, where is it? He goes, it's in the bunker. Oh, number two. Is it on? No. Where is it? It's in the bunker. Now, now it's, we're on four. And he hits a good drive. And same thing. Hits the second shot. Johnny's, is it on? Is it on? He goes, no. Where is it? He goes, I'm in the bunker again. And Chuck Periallo turns to me and he goes, Bob's in the bunker a lot. <laughs> And I'm like, well, that's Bunker Bob. <laughs> that's where that name came from. And that's where that name came from. I, I would bet you that, that a lot of the members don't even know what the guy's name is. Right. <laughs> they know Everybody Bob. knows Bunker Bob. You talk about Bunker Bob, and I mean, that just caught on out here. And, and it's a nickname that he's never going to gonna be able to get rid of. And I think he kind of likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of nicknames, I'm sure we can all figure out how counselor fits you, but did mm -hmm. somebody dub you that out here? Or? You know, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's, it's as though that has been my moniker forever out here, and I actually think Jerry Boykin started that. Um, you know, when I'd walk into the pro shop, he'd say, hi, counselor, or something like that, and then uh, you know the starting guys and the uh, and the assistant pros and you know all the members. So I that that's it's it's kind of uh, interesting how those things happen and just kind of stay with you. I think it's a good recognition of, of who you are, counselor or doctor, and it's a very nice compliment uh, and the nickname as well. Yeah. yeah well, it's uh, I, I've always. I've always uh, uh, fondly, uh, you know, remember and appreciate actually that uh, that kind of uh, uh, recognition from the from the members. I know even you know other lawyers here that uh, I have the tremendous amount of respect for. They're great lawyers, you know, and they they mostly still call me counselor, mm -hmm. yes. which is which is kind of interesting. That's great. I now have that on my golf ball. Good, <laughs> good. I like that. And I have a tap-in par on my license plate. <laughs> Very good. That was uh, interesting how that happened. I, <clears throat> I was filling out my, uh, driver, or my uh, license plate renewal in the office one day, and I had never never even thought about any of these vanity plates or anything like that and so you know again I don't know this must be 15 years ago or more and I'm filling this out and it asked you if you want to have you know have a, a you know a different name or something on it and it didn't cost that much more and, and uh, so in those days you had to uh, call the License Bureau in Columbus to find out if it was available. Right. So I called and this lady answered and I said, what's the story on that? She says, uh, well, you just tell me what, what name you want on it.